Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's morning session. I hope everyone is staying healthy. Uh, I'm Eva Zarnowska, an application scientist at Brooker Fluorescent Microscopy Business Unit in Madison, Wisconsin. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, um, who is Dr. Martin Tuneman. Dr. Tuneman was awarded with PhD in biochemistry from University of Tübingen in Germany. Uh, during his graduate studies, uh, Dr. Tuneman gained extensive knowledge in molecular imaging, microscopy, cardiovascular physiology, and mouse transgenesis. He did postdoctoral training in neurovascular imaging laboratory under Professor Anna Devor at the UC San Diego. He is leading several bioengineering efforts, including projects based on advanced multi-photon imaging methods, as well as electrophysiological recording in awake behaving mice. Dr. Tuneman recently joined the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Boston University as the research assistant professor. And before I hand the mic over to Dr. Tuneman, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. We would love to hear from you during the presentation. And if you have any question, please uh, feel free to send it through question tab. We will be answering questions at the end of the session. And please note that the recorded version of this webinar will be available on demand on Brooker's website. And the last thing, um, as always, we would like to encourage you to share this webinar on your social networks. And please do not forget to add hashtag Brooker Nano to your post. So uh, let's start then. Uh, the title of today's presentation is a two photon based phosphorescence lifetime imaging to PPLIM for in vivo oxygen measurements at high spatial and temporal resolution. Hope you will find the talk interesting and also few tips that, can, that you can apply to your research. Martin, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction and uh, thanks to giving me the platform to present this exciting method and some of our own data we generated with it. I subdivided the talk into four pieces. First, I want to give a brief introduction why we are interested in oxygen imaging. Uh, then I will go uh, into the method. I will talk about oxygen sensitive dyes and the two photon phosphorescence lifetime imaging microscopy method, abbreviated to PPLIM. And then I will show some applications to oxygen measurements in rodent brain and some other applications uh, I found uh, in the literature. So why oxygen imaging? As you all know, as seen or you find out as soon as you start to hold your breath, oxygen is essential for all aerobic um, organisms. So we cannot survive without having oxygen. We can somehow adapt, as you know, people climb from very high mountains and nature designed an incredibly sophisticated and compl uh, complicated system to deliver oxygen throughout the body to every cell. And there oxygen is mainly used uh, as the final acceptor of electrons in the respiratory chain uh, to generate in the end ATP, which is so to say the energy uh, currency inside the cell to perform all kinds of uh, functions. So in the organisms, it's ex it is extremely important uh, that oxygen is present at a relatively constant level to maintain the physiological status. And there can be happening some dynamic changes of local oxygen concentrations, uh, which depends on demand and supply. And these changes are kind of interesting because when we are able to follow them, we can use them to study the metabolic processes um, inside the cell or tissues. And uh, in our lab, we are mainly interested uh, on brain function and brain imaging. And I will talk a little bit about uh, this in context of oxygen imaging now. So our general question is, um, when we look into the brain, we usually consider it uh, as an organ working with electric and chemical signals. So we see a change in neuronal activity when neurons are firing. 
And at the same time, we have methods which can be used in humans non-invasively, like fMRI, which is functional magnetic resonance imaging, which can kind of visualize what is going on in the brain. And this is shown here in this cartoon in the bottom, um, where signal changes are shown depending on what uh, a person sees. However, this method is indirect, as I will elaborate on the next few slides. So we want to know what are the mechanisms which uh, generate these signal changes measurable in humans and what is their correlation. And this is the overall question we are trying to address, as Eva said, in Anna de Boer's Neurovascular Imaging Laboratory, which was until yesterday at UCSD and is now heading to Boston. And here you can see me sitting on one of the microscope boxes in front of a truck. So going a little bit more into detail, um, as I said, we are interested in uh, measuring changes in neuronal activity. However, when we are measuring non-invasively um, in humans or also experimental animals, for example, with fMRI, um, this is an indirect signal because what we are measuring in fMRI is a change in hemodynamic parameters and not the change in neuronal activity itself. So there's a long cascade of events in between uh, the change in neuron activity and the actual outcome, our signal, which is the change in cellular metabolism. Neurons are firing, they are more activated, they consume more oxygen. At the same time, messengers are released, which lead to vasodilation, which increases blood flow, which increases uh, the supply with oxygen, which all makes sense. And these change in macroscopic hemodynamic parameters are what we actually can detect in fMRI. And the question we try to address is how we can calculate back from a non-invasive MRI signal, for example, the change in neuronal activity. And our approach is to use uh, transgenic mice as model organisms, where we can basically tap into this entire signaling cascade and try to understand all the nuts and bolts uh, which are in between a change of neuron activity and the outcome, the signal. And here I have a long list of methods we are employing to tap into all these processes. Uh, when I start on the top left, we can use, for example, optogenetics to activate neural activity. We can use genetics and pharmacology to interfere with the signaling pathways. And then we have plenty of readouts, for example, electrophysiology to direct, uh, detect change in neural activity, or for example, calcium imaging, voltage imaging. We can detect changes in blood flow and changes in oxygen. Um, and on top of that, we can perform fMRI imaging in awake mice as well. So we basically can do everything what we can do in humans with mice, but we have way more ways to tap into all the different parts of that cascade and build a very good model, um, which then can be used to make uh, inferences from the imaging signal back to neuronal uh, activity, which then might hopefully be translatable to the human situation. And what I'm talking about today is one important method in our repertoire, which is uh, oxygen imaging. Now I'm coming to the method itself, and I'm going to start a little bit with the history. So um, the fact that oxygen affects the lifetime or the intensity of phosphorescence has been known for, I would say, yeah, about 100 years by now. And um, Kautsky and Hirsch, which uh, published in a journal, journal at the time, uh, suggested an apparatus where they let a gas over a sample of a phosphorescent dye, and if there's oxygen present, they would see a change in phosphorescence. However, it took about 60, 70 years until this has been used for an in vivo application. And this is a paper from 1988 from David Wilson's group at Penn University, where they used a dye, which is palladium coprocorphyrin, the structure is shown here, um, to measure uh, oxygen levels in the liver and the original data, which I guess was taken from a TV screen, is shown here. So the dye was applied to the liver and in the 
presence of oxygen, we see not much of phosphorescence, but as soon as they perfuse the liver with an oxygen-free um, uh, solution, the intensity of phosphorescence increases dramatically. And then, I think this is another liver, they started with a low oxygen solution and slowly started to bring oxygen back. And you can see the drop in phosphorescence intensity. The same is shown in a more recent uh, graph uh, from a publication from Sergei Vinogado's group. Um, if you look at the phosphorescence of a dye uh, between conditions in presence of oxygen or absence, you see this change in phosphorescence intensity. This is one way to measure it. However, you can also measure how fast the phosphorescence disappears from the sample. Sorry. Okay, now I want to start again. So I want to explain a little bit uh, what actually is phosphorescence and how oxygen is quenching this phosphorescence. And I start first with the more commonly known phenomenon, which is fluorescence, um, which uh, is basically the emission of light from an excited state, uh, which is called here as one for singlet state. And this emission happens within nanoseconds. In certain fluorescent, uh, in certain dyes, um, especially ones which carry heavier atoms, the process called intersystem crossing can happen. In that case, the uh, molecule uh, converts into a so called triplet state, which has a much longer lifetime. And when light is emitted from this triplet state, we are talking about phosphorescence. And uh, for our purposes, uh, the lifetimes are within a range of microseconds. So now we bring oxygen into the play. Um, when this dye, once it's in the triplet state, is interacting with oxygen, oxygen can undergo a conversion from the triplet state, which is its natural state under low energy, into the singlet state, and the energy which would have been emitted as phosphorescence is instead taken up by the oxygen. And as there are not many molecules uh, around which have this naturally occurring triplet state, this process is very specific for oxygen. Okay, so how are we performing this kind of experiment in a nutshell? So we have a dye which can be phosphorescent. We are in the presence of oxygen and we are recording the intensity decay of this phosphorescence. Um, here again are these three curves and depending on the amount of oxygen, uh, you get different uh, steepness of the decay. These curves usually can be fitted with a mono exponential function and we estimate the lifetime of the decay, which is called tau. And the more oxygen is present, the faster the decay, the lower the lifetime. And then we take uh, another um, equation, which is called Stern-Former equation, which correlates the lifetime or the reciprocal of the lifetime with the oxygen concentration in the sample. And the two yellow highlighted parameters here are first the reciprocal of the lifetime of this uh, dye in absence of oxygen and the so-called quenching constant. And those are parameters which depend on the dye itself and can be varied depending on how the dye is made up. And um, they can be used to perform or they can be determined in an in vitro calibration. And then uh, once you have the lifetime tau, you can estimate the oxygen concentration. Um, graphs are shown here, so uh, under ideal conditions you have a linear relationship between the amount of oxygen in the sample and the reciprocal of the lifetime. Um, now I want to talk a little bit more about these uh, uh, oxygen sensitive dyes. Ideally, for biological applications, they need to be water soluble, biological inert and non-toxic, and I will come back to that point uh, a little bit later. They should be bright, so this process of phosphorescence should be very efficient in those. They should show a mono-exponential decay, 
and their lifetime and quenching constant should allow us to measure oxygen in a dynamic range of 0 to 160 millimeter Hg, which is the range uh, occurring under in vivo conditions. And of course, uh, once we are talking about applications uh, in tissue, we want to have optical properties which make them usable under in vivo conditions. And one point there is, of course, to have dyes which are two photon excitable. Um, the dye, which is uh, two photon excitation, um, is one method uh, to excite the dye. Um, and I guess you know it from many uh, life science applications. And in that case, um, the dye would be excited with two photons at the same time at a lower energy. So these photons have, uh, are infrared, so they can penetrate deeper into the tissue. And at the same time, the excitation only happens in the focal plane where the photon flux is high enough. So we gain capabilities of optical sectioning. And importantly, the quenching mechanism is independent whether you excite the dye with two photon or single photon excitation. Um, the most recent and most powerful two photon excitable dye was recently published and was made in the lab by Sergei Vinogradov at uh, UPenn. And the structure is shown here. So again, we have a porphyrin like uh, core with platinum in its center. Um, but it has been modified in its core structure to allow for efficient two photon excitation. And then you may recognize that it has some pretty large bulky side chains. And um, if you look at the molecular simulation of uh, the structure, um, we can see that the core is basically encapsulated in these side chains, which um, leads uh, to its uh, physiological properties. So the core is protected. It becomes soluble through that. Um, it's biologically inert, and um, by modifying the side chains, um, they have been tuning the quenching constant in a sense that the dye has ideal properties um, of oxygen sensitivity. Um, so this dye was published in 2019, but that was not the time when researchers started to use uh, oxygen imaging with two-photon microscopy. Um, and before, a different dye largely has been used, which is called PTPC343. And it was published in around 2008, and it's again from Sergei Vinogradov's lab. And in that case, um, the actual core didn't show very high two photon excitability. So it was very dim under two photon excitation. So they used the clever trick to allow this, uh, to use this dye under two photon um excitation so they integrated a coumarin residue into the periphery of the dye in an ideal distance that energy can be transferred from these coumarin dyes into the core and this is shown in this energy scheme here so the coumarin dye is easily excitable with two photon excitation the energy then can be transmitted into the core which then can undergo phosphorescence or oxygen quenching. Um, so this was a very clever trick to enable two-photon imaging without having a two-photon excitable um, porphyrin core here. Um, this slide, however, shows that the recently published Oxy42P dye is way more powerful, so the oxygen Oxygen sensitivities are somewhat similar. However, the quantum yield is about two times larger, and the two photon uh, absorption cross section is about six times larger. And um, in the initial evaluation of this dye published uh, in 2019, um, they showed that um, this dye allows an imaging speed which is 60 times faster than with the previous PTP C343. And because the absorption and excitation, sorry, the two photon excitation and the phosphorescence emission are redshifted, um, it allows to image two times deeper into the tissue. Um, now I come to how to uh, detect 
phosphorescence under two photon excitation conditions. And I want to remind you that typical two photon lasers um, send out femtosecond laser pulses with a repetition rate of about, or for example, 80 megahertz. So the period between two pulses is about 12.5 uh, nanoseconds. Um, if we are looking at fluorescence, that's not a problem because fluorescence has a lifetime of a few nanoseconds. So the fluorescence disappears within the time until the next laser pulse excites the sample again. However, if we are looking now at phosphorescent dyes, which have a lifetime of microseconds, we would see this one, uh, this behavior here. So every time a new pulse comes, we would excite some more dye until we would reach saturation and we would never be able to access the lifetime so the decay of phosphorescence, because there would be a new laser pulse exciting uh, a sample again. Um, and this problem can be solved uh, quite simply by just gating the laser excitation to the sample. So one can either use an electro-optical modulator, a buckle cell, or an acoustical optical modulator and gate the laser excitation. That means we open up excitation for about 10 microseconds, send in laser pulses, and we let uh, a population of phosphorescent dye build up. And then we close the gate, so we don't allow any further excitation on the sample. And while the gate is closed, we can collect the lifetime, uh, the phosphorescence, and estimate the lifetime from this decay. Um, here are some more details. Um, the lifetime is collected, uh, the decay is collected during the gate off period. And we have to repeat that because we are in a single photon counting regime. So every time we open and close the gate, we will count a few photons as it's shown here on the right. And once we repeat this a couple of times, for example, 15 times, 50 times, uh, we build up a distribution of photons as shown here, which will allow us um, to estimate the lifetime of the phosphorescence. Um, so for one pixel, we need to repeat this on-off period or one cycle for a number of times until we get a sufficient uh, level of photons um, that we can use to estimate the lifetime and oxygen concentration from that. And of course, if we want to acquire an image, that means we need to move uh, the excitation laser with Galvos um, into one pixel. We acquire a certain number of cycles. We move to the next pixel and so on and so forth. Um, this is a picture of our setup, which is based on a Brucker Ultima set, uh, microscope. Um, we introduced some custom modifications in order to make the two photon application, uh, sorry, the phosphorescent lifetime application more um, efficient. First, we put two EOMs instead of one into the laser path, which helps to attenuate uh, the uh, laser during the gate off period more efficiently. Then we uh, use a gallium arsenide PMT, which has a higher sensitivity at wavelengths between 700 and 900 nanometers, where we collect the phosphorescence of oxy42p. And um, we use custom designed filters like this main dichroic and this uh, IR blocking filters here with a 900 nanometer cutoff, as well as one photon optogenetic capabilities. And the entire setup is integrated uh, into um, or controlled by the Prairie View software. So the signals from the PMT are going into a counting card and everything is controlled by Prairie View. Uh, on the right, you can see a screenshot um, of Prairie View. You have uh, the decay um, of phosphorescence shown here and an overview image, uh, which looks somewhat pixelated um, here, which represents the photon counts. And um, 
Here, I just want to give a brief uh, overview about the publications or the first time uh, this method has been used. There were two publications uh, before 2008. Um, they have been showing that this two photon phosphorus lifetime imaging method is possible, but they didn't use uh, two photon excitable dyes. So they were very much limited uh, in their signal to noise. And then with PTP C343, uh, there were two publications uh, in 2010 and 2011. One was uh, from the Martinus Center at Harvard, led uh, by Sava, together with Anna DeVor and David Boas. And in 2011, a paper from Sarah Chapak's lab um, in Paris. And recently, uh, the publication of Oxy4-2P, the first one was in 2018, again from Sava's lab, and uh, a very detailed um, testing and um, quantification of the properties of Oxy4-2P was published in 2019 by Ezekova uh, together with um, Bruno Weber's lab in Zurich. With that, I want to come to uh, some applications for oxygen measurements, and I will focus here on the brain. Um, here's a list of interesting questions you can address um, using ox oxygen imaging. We, for example, can look at um, metabolism or oxygen consumption under baseline conditions versus functional activation. So we can, for example, look at um, the magnitude of oxygen level changes uh, when we activate a certain brain region and how big the metabolic reserves are. We can look um, how different are um, metabolic costs depending on the activation of different cell types. For example, if we activate excitatory or inhibitory neurons, we can look um, whether anatomical properties, for example, neuronal or vascular density or the distribution of different cell types reflects itself in the oxygen metabolism. We can look at neuromodulation. Of course, um, we want to try to correlate our readouts with microscopic changes such as bold fMRI. And um, we want to look at oxygen in pathophysiological conditions for example, aging, neurodegeneration, and stroke. And for brain imaging, um, two very different ways have been used where the dye was administered. And in the first instance, the dye was injected into the vasculature. And as the dye is pretty large, um, it remains in the vasculature for an extended period of time. And when you perform oxygen imaging, then um, you basically collect the oxygen concentrations inside single vessels. And you can generate either two-dimensional or three-dimensional maps here. And you can follow the changes of oxygen concentrations across the vascular network, starting, for example, here in the middle in red with an artery delivering oxygen-rich blood through the capillary network back to the veins. Another way is to inject the dye directly into the tissue and measure oxygen concentrations within the brain tissue itself. And on the next couple of slides, I want to uh, show some data which was collected by two postdocs in our lab, uh, Natalie and Philip. First, some details on the preparation. So we are imaging or we started to imaging awake mice. Um, for that, um, the animals undergo a surgery where a head post is implanted, which allows us to fix them under the microscope and a craniotomy with a window, which is uh, typically located over the sensory cortex, specifically the barrel field, which uh, is innervated by um, the whiskers. In order to deliver the oxy 4 p dye, we make a little hole into the glass, which is covered with silicon. So these animals, um, after the surgery, recover for two, three weeks. And this preparation is entirely 
isolated from the environment. However, we can inject through the silicon port once we are performing the imaging experiment, a small amount of Oxy42P, which then allows us to uh, perform the imaging. When we are performing the imaging, the animals have been trained to be comfortable during head fixation. They are getting rewards, for example, sugar water. Um, we are recording them with an infrared camera and at the same time we are recording motion using an accelerometer. We typically look at locations uh, which are close to arteries, so arteries which come from the brain surface and penetrate into the cortical tissue and deliver oxygen-rich blood into the tissue. And maybe you can see on these uh, images where we injected a dye which labels the vasculature um, that surrounding these arterioles, you see kind of a lack of capillaries which would otherwise um, supply the tissue with oxygen. And this is due to the fact that the oxygen can diffuse out of the arterioles into the surrounding tissue and is uh, sufficient to supply the cells in the vicinity of this arteriole. So we look for a location where we have a nicely defined arteriole and then um, we check that we have sufficient loading with Oxy42P and then we place the grid over this location. In this case, it's a grid of 20 by 20 points. And at these points, we will collect phosphorescence lifetime to measure oxygen concentrations. And just to get you an idea about the timing for that, um, I have this little table here on the right. Um, we collect the data in repetitions where we acquire 50 excitation and uh, collection cycles per point. In that case, we have 400 points uh, mounting up to six seconds of acquisition, considering that one point takes, uh, one cycle takes 300 microseconds to acquire. In the end, we acquire 20 repetitions, uh, which mounts up to 1,000 cycles per point, uh, which takes about two minutes. Um, which will give us one oxygen map. However, as the mice are awake, they move during the acquisition. We collect this motion with the accelerometer or the webcam, and we can remove some of the repetitions um, where we detected motion to improve data quality. So these two minutes are kind of an oversampling of uh, the time um, uh, of the data. Um, and the results are shown here. Um, so this is the grid and this is the actual map of oxygen concentrations. And as you would expect in direct vicinity to the arterial, uh, we have a high concentration of oxygen, which then decays throughout the tissue. And when we are getting close to other small vessels, capillaries, we see again an increase in oxygen concentrations. And we plot this data uh, in relation to the radius from this arteriole, and we get this drop in oxygen concentration. And then towards the end, we observe points uh, where we get a rise again, which is due to the fact that we are getting close to these capillaries. Um, together with Bruker, we um, or basically we asked Bruker to refine their software a little bit to allow to acquire circular grids of oxygen um, concentrations, which is beneficial in a sense that we know exactly where our center is, which is the arterial, and we measure oxygen concentrations in a radial fashion away from the sample. And this has the huge advantage compared to the square grid that we dense, uh, more densely sample points in direct relation to the arteriole where we have this decay. Then this decay in the end is an important uh, parameter which allows us to estimate the oxygen consumption uh, in the tissue. <clears throat> 
Um, this goes back to a model which was originally devised for muscle. And it assumes that we have our source of oxygen, which is the arterial, in the middle of a cylinder. And we don't have any other sources around, which is kind of fulfilled uh, in close vicinity to the arterial where we don't have any other feeding uh, capillaries. And then with some mathematical model, we can estimate from the decay of oxygen concentration from the center, from the arterial into the periphery, the consumption of oxygen which in, within the tissue. And an example graph is shown here for, um, here for this uh, kind of data. And currently we are refining these methods um, to get a more robust estimation of this parameter uh, together with Gauter, Einofall and Understale. Another application are dynamic measurements. Um, here, for example, um, we deliver an air puff to the animal. And in order to achieve a faster timing resolution, we acquire not the entire grid of points, but only one grid of points, which are uh, 20 points. Um, and then in response to the stimulus, which are two seconds of stimulation with three hertz, we see an increase in oxygen concentration. So we activate this region of the brain. Um, this leads to an increase in perfusion, delivery of oxygen-rich blood. And especially in close vicinity to the arterioles, we see a higher increase. And in further distance to the feeding arterial, we see a smaller increase in oxygen, but we don't see a decay, which means that this uh, increase in perfusion is sufficient um, to maintain a sufficient oxygen level uh, within the tissue for the neurons to function. Uh, one last application, um, which I took from publications, are um, to follow PO2 levels after microstrokes. And microstrokes are kind of a model for larger strokes in humans. However, in that case, only one of the feeding arterioles um, is being occluded by intensi uh, high intensity illumination with a laser. And either oxygen can be measured again with a dye which is delivered into the vasculature as shown on the left side or um, in vicinity to the occluded vessel uh, inside the tissue. And on the left um, are results which were made with PTPC343. And typically what you see is that when you start uh, measuring oxygen at the top um, and in the center of the vessel, you have a high oxygen concentration and then more and more oxygen is extracted towards the periphery. Um, and after occlusion, this uh, behavior turned around entirely, which indicates that um, due to um, some interconnections between um, vascular branches, there is some backup to ensure that the tissue, which is downstream of this occluded vessel, vessel can still um, uh, receive oxygen. And on the right, um, this is from the publication with Oxy4GP. Um, we can look at the temporal um, evol um, evolution of um, the hypoxia caused by the vascular occlusion. Uh, here we see a drop in oxygen concentration just after uh, the vessel was occluded, 10 minutes after. And um, there is an almost complete recovery over four days of time. Now I want to show some other applications which are outside the brain. Um, there's some interesting publications out there which used two photon or single photon phosphorescent lifetime imaging. Uh, one very much discussed paper came out in 2014 in Nature and they used um, oxygen imaging to measure oxygen concentrations inside the bone marrow. Um, 
there were many uh, hints that within the bone marrow where we have uh, stem cells, um, an hypoxic environment exists. So they derive that from the expression of particular genes inside the stem cells. And using oxygen imaging, they could uh, directly show that within the bone marrow where the stem cells reside, we indeed have an hypoxic environment, which then can also be altered by, for example, um, irradiation or different applications of drugs. Another application was to measure oxygen within the gastrointestinal tract of mice. Uh, here they uh, introduced a probe and observed a very steep uh, drop in oxygen concentrations inside the lumen. And um, these oxygen concentrations determine to some extent which kind of bacteria are growing there. And um, they also showed that if they change these oxygen concentrations, the microbiome uh, changes accordingly. And they used oxygen imaging to make a direct correlation between the bacteria they uh, found in there and the actual oxygen concentration. Another important application is imaging of tumors. Um, it's generally um, known that tumors show often hypoxic regions. Um, and one potential uh, strategy to see if uh, tumor therapies are functioning is if these hypoxic regions are somewhat changing, which means we would need to see if uh, we need to measure oxygen in these regions. And this has been done uh, quite a couple of times. And here's one example. There are two different tumor models which are implanted into uh, a mouse and phosphorescence imaging has been performed over time while these animals underwent uh, anti-tumor therapy. And you can see that uh, one tumor shows a drastic increase in uh, oxygen levels while the other did not so much. Uh, in a similar sense, um, one group uh, correlated these hypoxic regions in tumor tissue with imaging of T cells. Um, and they uh, saw that there is a correlation between uh, hypoxia and uh, migration of T cells inside the tumor regions. And in an in vitro study, um, other researchers uh, measured uh, the oxygen distribution in so-called neurospheres, which are three-dimensional neuronal cell cultures. And this is kind of interesting. Um, at that time, they haven't been using organoids derived from stem cells, but um, other cells. But this is uh, essentially a very important question in the field of organoid biology, um, because these organoids grow to some extent. and uh, they don't receive enough oxygen from the surrounding culture medium and using oxygen imaging um, one can address the question to which extent the oxygen levels inside these three-dimensional cultures are sufficient um, or how strongly they drop and then there are uh, some other publications out where oxygen levels and consumption has been measured in skeletal muscle liver kidney as well as in isolated cardiac myocytes as well as pancreatic islets with that, I'm already at my summary and conclusion. Uh, I hope I could show you uh, that phosphorescence lifetime imaging is a powerful method for quantitative in vivo oxygen measurements at high spatial and temporal resolution. Um, with Boxy42P, we have a new probe which enables high performance oxygen measurements um, using two photon phosphorescence lifetime imaging. Um, the integration of two photon plim is actually simple and straightforward. Um, and regarding applications, a major focus in the field was uh, to measure oxygen metabolism uh, in brain, either delivered into the vasculature or uh, into the tissue. But we are seeing more and more uh, applications emerge, which are outside uh, brain. And with that, I want to conclude. I want to thank uh, 
Anna de Wors Lab at UCSD, as well as our collaboration partners at Boston University, uh, at MGH, especially also Sergey from UPenn, who's creating these dyes, and Brooker, who always had an open ear for suggestions uh, how the Prairie software can be improved to make phosphorescent lifetime imaging uh, easier. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Martin, uh, for the presentation. You got uh, acknowledgement um, for your for the you know for very clear presentation from uh, from the audience. Um, I will start with the question. I would also like to ask you to check um, the question tab on your webinar uh, oh, yeah. panel. Do you mm -hmm. see? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, uh, okay. Do you see the questions? Um, yeah, I try to open it. Okay, so um, mm -hmm. I will, okay, so I will read it. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on the Cisterna Magna route for dye injection versus intracortical. And then the second question, is there sufficient sensitivity to the text oxygen changes at the capillary level beyond the arteriolus? Mm. Oh yeah. Uh, hi, Andy. Thank you much for these questions. <laughs> um, actually, I think the Cisterna Magna injections are a great alternative. Um, we have been trying it, but as we are transitioning to Boston University, uh, we didn't got the animal protocols written up here and we want to try it um, back uh, once we are arriving at EU. Um, I think a huge advantage there is that you don't need to inject repeatedly. And I think in the paper from Sergey's and Bruno Weber's group, they have shown that the level of dye is sufficient enough for two or three days uh, to be imaged. And regarding the sensitivity um, in capillaries, um, I'm pretty sure it is sufficient. And if I'm not entirely mistaken, there's already a paper out I think it's Iqbal's paper, which uh, where they were looking at um, oxygen levels in the capillaries. I'm, I'm maybe mixing up something right now, but um, in principle, it should be possible. So you did address two, two questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, another acknowledgement. Thank you for the great talk from Melissa Scala. Scala. Thank you. And. Um, I have a question also um, uh, more kind of related to the technique. Um, um, what do you like the most about the technique uh, that you use and you presented and what kind of development would you like to see in the future? Oh, um, well, what I like most about the technique is to some extent um, it's uh, so I think with the advent of Oxy42P, which is not long ago, it just be became much more powerful. So, I mean, if you were looking at calcium imaging and from GCAM1 to GCAM3 to GCAM6, I think with uh, the new dyes which are now available, we just went through like one of these very early iterations in the field of calcium imaging. So we got a huge increase in uh, imaging speed and brightness and can image deeper. So I think that's pretty exciting because it opens the way to more applications. And um, one thing I'm personally interested in is to start using the oxygen imaging in a multimodal way. So we could either perform fluorescence lifetime or fluorescence imaging at the same time. Um, which is perfectly possible with the hardware. Um, and on the other hand, um, combining oxygen imaging with non-imaging techniques, for example, electrophysiology, for example, by using um, deformable arrays, which have very good or a degree of transparency, 
that you can directly correlate electrophysiology signals with the oxygen signals. And in that case, uh, I think um, referring back to the cisterna magna injection, um, it's uh, beneficial because as soon as we make our preparation more complicated and we don't have to interfere with the preparation itself, but can inject the dye in a remote location, uh, it will be just more easier for us. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you. And then uh, you mentioned that uh, you would like to do this multimodal um, investigation. So um, do you think that, um, I don't know, but maybe is it possible to do flim and flim imaging using that Oxifor 2P dye right now? Um, uh, have you tried? Uh, we didn't try. Um, actually, it's, uh, with the system which is integrated into um, the Bruca hardware, so these Becker and Hickel systems are, as far as I know, always uh, capable of measuring both PLIM and PLIM at the same time. And technically, when we do our PLIM experiments, we also acquire the fluorescence decays while the gate is open. So if we would have a dye there which has a fluorescence and which is meaningful as far as to collect, um, we would could uh, we could use it right away. Um, that's yeah. uh, one thing. The other thing is um, if the dye wouldn't be compatible with the um, spectral properties of our system right now, which is of course tailored to detect um, oxy 4 p one could integrate a second PMT and have a second channel and collect uh, fluorescence in a different spectral range, mm -hmm. but still using the, uh, to, uh, the phosphorescence lifetime regime where you um, have an excitation gate and collect uh, sorry, fluorescence at the same time and phosphorescence while the gate is closed. So, um, I mean, in the end, it depends on what exactly you want to do. And at some point, of course, how much money you want to spend on expanding the system. But it's perfectly possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I, I, uh, you received another question uh, mm -hmm. from the audience um, yeah. um, from Rob Weiss. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for a similar approach to perform wide field imaging to look at brain region specific changes in oxygen? So, yes and yes. So on one hand side, um, these dyes I was referring to, Oxy42P and other similar dyes, um, can be excited with one photon excitation. So actually the very first um, studies um, were not done at all with two photon um, excitation. Um, what you do there is using a flash illumination. So you basically uh, excite the phosphorescent dyes uh, with one brief flash of light. And then you use um, typically a sensitive camera uh, to acquire pictures in a very fast sequence, which then gives you the decay of the phosphorescence. Um, I don't know how developed this is at this point because um, people may have started to use uh, two photon imaging for that, but in principle it's possible. And then there are other methods which are not related to phosphorescence as well, which you can use to measure oxygen inside the brain. For example, uh, spectral imaging where you illuminate the light, uh, the brain with different wavelengths. Um, to measure the absorption of hemoglobin. And um, this gets you an idea um, on uh, changes, which are, of course, inside the tissue. Um, I think uh, you have a question from Anna, and I think Anna is gonna just to speak, right? Yeah, do you guys hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Hello, hello. Yeah, hello. Thank you, Martin, and um, it's a great webinar. Uh, very good work. Um, I just want time to chime in on a few questions that uh, Martin already covered partially. So first about capillaries. If if we use intravascular delivery of the dye, we of course can see capillaries because um, you know everything else is black and capillaries are labeled, so there's no problem resolving capillaries. 
for tissue imaging, if we want to look at the decay around capillaries, we don't think that we currently have enough sensitivity to be able to see that. So for intravascular imaging, no problem. For tissue imaging, we can't really see this kind of gradient around capillaries like what we see around arteries. Um, for cisternal injection, obviously a good thing is that the dye seems to be staying there according to Bruno's work for a while. Um, a suboptimal thing is that it ends up with some dye being at the surface of the brain under the glass. And so um, our limiting factor currently in terms of how deep we can penetrate is out of focus signal, which is on top of our imaging plane. And if we have some dye on the surface, this limits how deep we can image. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for Melissa's question of further developments, of course, we want to image faster and we want to be more sensitive. The problem with imaging faster is there's, that there's a trade-off between how much, how much signal we're going to get from the probe and how fast is the decay. So we, of course, want the decay to be faster so that we can image faster. But there is this trade-off that limits our speed. Hmm. Yeah. Well, at some point, if the decay is too fast, um, it's getting very unlikely that the um, dye molecule interacts with oxygen, so we are losing sensitivity from that side. So one good thing about the triplet state and the relatively slow decay is that the molecules have enough time to find oxygen and to more or less physically interact with them. So ideally, I mean, one could say we would use uh, fluorescence quenching to measure oxygen, but then we have the problem that it happens very rarely that uh, a dye molecule within a couple of nanoseconds sees oxygen. So um, there is always a trade-off exactly. to some extent there. Yeah, yeah, so this is totally right. And, and the last point is that um, in terms of fluorescence and phosphorescence, so oxyphor 2P is uh, not supposed to give you much fluorescence to start with. Mm -hmm. But um, if you do have another fluorescent dye and, you want, and you're able to excite them, um, you know, with the same wavelength, or maybe you have two different laser beams that are channeled into, um, through the objective, so then you can do that, and Becker and Hickel actually always generate both fluorescence and phosphorescence files. So what they do is that during our gate, you would get normal flame data, which is fluorescence lifetime. And then in addition to this, during our phosphorescence decay, you're going to get our normal phosphorescence data. Yeah. Oh. Thank you, Anna, so much for this, yeah. uh, for connecting and, you know, making this more interactive. Of course. Yes. Um, I, um, if there are any other questions, please just raise your hand. I, I'm going to unmute you and uh, you can just ask a question directly. Uh, if you didn't have time to put uh, into, you know, write it down. Um, so I don't see anybody raising hand. I think, uh, Martin, we're going to finish um you okay. get a lot of acknowledgement uh, for a very clear thank and nice much. presentation uh thank you so much for your time good luck with the move to boston um <laughs> uh yes um big change from san diego to boston um well but i will all, all the different trades uh, you pack the microscopes in uh, for firewood in the first winter there <laughs> exactly <laughs> All right. So thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining uh, for this this morning session. I hope you enjoyed, and I uh, invite you to the next one. And please uh, look for the webinar on the Booker's website. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.